dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's a great honor for me to introduce uh, one of the greatest scientists and visionaries of modern era, uh, who, as uh, nobody else, uh, manifested the zeitgeist of the transpersonal. I first uh, met Stengroff in uh, 1980 uh, in the Soviet Union, but it was indirectly, of course, through his book Realms of Human Unconsciousness. When I got uh, this book, I started reading it in the evening and couldn't put it down until I finished it uh, in the next morning. I was uh, 24 and uh, for me it was the uh, first time in my life I was introduced to the most powerful insights into the nature of human psyche and its evolution. And uh, this is uh, the reason why I am transpersonologist. Like many other Russians uh, who read uh, Grove's books published unofficially by some staff underground private publishing, I never dreamt, dreamed that uh, the time uh, would come and I would see him in life. But the dreams came true when uh, Stan Christina Grove visited Russia after perestroika in April uh, 1989. They introduced holotropic breathwork and the whole realm of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Uh, and I've seen uh, how hundred excited people greeted the groves and asked signatures of the Summers Dark copies of Stan, uh, Stan's uh, book. When in 2001 uh, Stan and Christina uh, visited Russia again to give keynote speech at 10th conference of European Association of Psychotherapy and to lead the panel of transpersonal psychotherapy, almost half of the conference uh, around uh, 500 people went to the panel, while the other half of the attendees spread over the uh, uh, 40 other uh, panels. This is how great the growths are received in Europe and in Russia. Uh, I uh, had a great privilege to complete a growth transpersonal training with Christina and Stan in 1993 and uh, serve as uh, a channel for the transpersonal in Russia and tech Soviet Union uh, through publication, all Russian edition of the book, around 20 books uh, were published, and now the new one about Hans Rudi Giger uh, will, uh, will be published soon, and also uh, through seminars, conferences, and professional education. Stan, I am sure, is one of the, um, not only one of the founders of the whole transpersonal field, as we know, and International Transpersonal Association, science and visionary, who dedicated over uh, 57 years to the study of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And what's for me even more important, he is a man of great heart, true compassion and unlimited wisdom. He is really a holy grail of the transpersonal. Please meet Stan Grof. <laughs> if you don't mind, I ask if I can sit. Yeah. So maybe we can sort of arrange the, the angle here. It's not just a geriatric request. <laughs> I will be 83 this year, but I had a back operation and followed by a car accident. So um, it's just for me much more comfortable to do it this way. Okay, can you hear? Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Although, um, when something like this happens, I feel uh, ambivalent because it creates such expectations <laughs> that it's not easy to live up to them. So I, I will do my best. And uh, if I should uh, somehow uh, return the favor and say something about uh, Bologna, I would lose much of the time of my, my uh, talk this morning. He has done some amazing work in Russia. He really basically brought the transfers of ideas. He uh, managed translation of uh, some of the most uh, important uh, books. He has uh, participated in media and in movies. Uh, so we're very, very grateful for 
that you have done. And I would also like to thank for this invitation. It's great to see the different uh, organizations uh, the transversal orientation to come together. Um, Christine and I all, um, always uh, hope that um, the transversal movement will not have to go through all the other uh, depth psychologies when you know, the splits in uh, psychoanalysis and psychosynthesis and other areas. So it's great to see, to see people coming, uh, coming together. I had a, a PowerPoint presentation for this lecture and I found out there was no um, LCD uh, available. So um, I will try to do my best without the, the pictures that I wanted to show. Uh, I would like to start in a way that's somewhat unusual in that I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Please don't uh, uh, raise your hands until I, I finish this kind of a list uh, <coughs> that I would like to tell you. Um, how many of you experience in your own life some powerful, non-ordinary states of consciousness? Doesn't have to be psychedelics, could be some powerful form of psychotherapy, spiritual practice. Some people have powerful experiences during sports, <coughs> near-death experiences, or experiences that just happen. You don't ask for them, you don't do anything to induce them. You might be inviting them and they happen anyway. So can I see the hands? Okay. <laughs> you know, this is a somewhat self-selected audience. <laughs> we get this, this kind of response anywhere uh, where we go. <coughs> How many of you have experienced the holotropic breathwork that Christina and I developed? Also quite a few. Now the reason I'm asking this question before my talks is because uh, what I talk about is drawn on uh, research of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And it's much easier to relate to that material if you had some personal experiences that you can uh, refer uh, this material to. Now I have so far talked about uh, non-ordinary experiences, but uh, my interest all these years, and over half a century, has been a very important particular subgroup, large subgroup of uh, non-ordinary experiences which have, according to my experience, healing potential, they have transformative potential, they have even evolutionary potential, and they have what we call heuristic potential. In other words, uh, when we work with these states, we can find some uh, uh, revolutionary new insights about uh, consciousness, about uh, human psyche, about emotional psychosomatic disorders, about a strategy of self-exploration and uh, psychotherapy and so on. And uh, I was astounded that current psychology and psychiatry does not have a special name for this category. We actually use uh, a term uh, altered states of consciousness coined by my friend Charlie Tart, but uh, I really dislike that term. And, um, I know that many of my friends who did consciousness research uh, are trying to avoid that term because it sounds pejorative. Uh, the idea that we, uh, is a way of correctly experiencing ourselves and the world, and that in these states it's altered, it's kind of distorted. I always think about veterinary medicine, you know, I, I will get my pet all <laughs> no, no. So I have too much respect uh, for these states to call them uh, altered. And there was simply no other term. We don't have a, a category of mystical experience, spiritual experience. People get diagnosis, uh, and I'm pretty serious, diagnosis for having, having these uh, experiences. So I decided to coin that term myself and I started calling them holotropic. Holos means whole, and trepane means moving towards something, uh, moving in the direction of something, like heliotropism is the property of the, the plant to orient itself, to move towards, uh, 
towards uh, the sun. So holotropic means moving toward wholeness. Very frequently when I mention that in our culture, they say, what do we mean moving toward wholeness? Aren't we whole already the way we operate in everyday uh, life? And I would have to say no. You know, we we uh, experience only a small fraction of our total identity as long as we are in the, in the everyday, ordinary state of consciousness. And uh, I usually um, point out to uh, uh, Hindu religion. In the Hindu religion, you, you would hear, uh, we are not Nama Rupa, we are not name and shape. Our true identity is uh, the core of, of the spark of cosmic creative energy that we carry in our innermost uh, core, the innermost core of our being. And the Hindus would call it the uh, Atman. And this is not a belief uh, or delusion in the Hindu culture. They would give you uh, specific procedures, uh, practices, and if you pursue them, you have a chance to have an experience that would validate it. This is, this is something that each of us can experience. And when we have that experience, we realize that that energy is identical with the energy that created uh, the universe. So our true identity, according to the Hindus, is Atman Brahman. And uh, the work with uh, holotropic states really brings uh, experiential validation for this. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is the way things are, but it's a very, very good uh, uh, worldview. It's a great perspective on existence that emerges, and it's very coherent. Um, it's now uh, getting to be as coherent as uh, the materialistic worldview seem to be. And if we look at it, the, the materialistic worldview is just another story. I mean, when we get these uh, descriptions of uh, where the universe came from, you know, the singularity 13.4 billion years ago, and out of it comes time and space and all the uh, matter for the, for the billions of galaxies, it's not a down to earth, sober, rational explanation, you know, a very, very important problem. So, so what emerged out of these holotropic states is an alternative understanding of who we are, what it is all about, that's very coherent, that's very consistent, and like the materialistic worldview seem to be supported by our everyday experiences, this alternative, at least uh, what, what uh, Aldous Huxley called perennial philosophy, can be systematically validated if we experiment, experiment uh, responsibly with these holotropic states. So if in the Upanishad you read, uh, who are we, who, who am I, the answer is Tatvam Asi, thou art that. You are it with a capital I. Your true uh, identity is divine, it's not uh, best theory, not just sort of, I develop animals, we also have a have uh, this kind of a divine nature which we can discover in this kind of uh, exploration. The Anishadvan said, we are not human beings having spiritual experiences, we are spiritual beings having human experiences. Now this idea of the um, essential identity of the individual with the divine is really at, at the mystical core, it's a secret sort of mystical core of all nature. Religion. So you find these kinds of statements in the mystical branches of all religions. Now I was I, uh, myself introduced to these holotropic states when, as a beginning psychiatrist, I uh, volunteered for a, for a LSD session, which in my case was also combined with a powerful stroboscopic light. My, my preceptor was interested in EEG, and he was particularly interested how you can drive or entrain brain waves by, ex by exposing people to powerful stroboscopic light. So as my experience was culminating, I was exposed to this stroboscope, and this became just a life-transforming experience for me. I lost uh, consciousness, my consciousness left my body. Uh, I lost the, the clinic, I lost the planet. 
and the feeling of, of being exterminated, of ceasing to exist, becoming nothing, but at the same time, I had the feeling that I became all of existence. <coughs> and then, uh, when I was coming down, as uh, this experiment was, was ending, I found the planet again, I found the clinic, I found my body, but for a long time, it was difficult for me to align my consciousness with my body. And it became clear to me that consciousness is not what they taught me, which is like a product of the brain. That consciousness is a uh, cosmic phenomenon, it's much, much larger than the brain ever could be. And I saw that it would be easier to explain uh, the experience of the material world from consciousness as, as uh, uh, what we call now virtual reality, then it would be to explain how consciousness could be generated by matter. I was at the time when this happened, I was in a kind of identity crisis. I, I went to uh, study psychiatry because I read Freud. And uh, at the time when I had the psychiatric session, my, my excitement about Freud started sort of subsiding. I was still excited about the theory, but uh, I was realizing that this is something that takes uh, years, you know, takes a lot of money, energy, and I was realizing that the results were not exactly breathtaking. I had uh, seven years of psychoanalysis myself three times a week, you know, a lot of money, a lot of investment. And if you ask me, did it change you? I say, well, I changed, you know, about seven years, it's a long time, to change anyway. And there was no uh, convincing evidence for me that uh, what the changes that happened in me had anything to do with the free associations that I was uh, doing on the couch. And don't misunderstand me, I loved every moment of it. I loved to play, play with my dreams and finding there was meaning in each slip of the tongue. But uh, if I compare it with what would happen in that one day in the LSD session, you know, I was one person walking into that room in the morning and I was another person walking out in the evening and there was absolutely no question in my mind why it happened, you know, what it was. So I came down from the session extremely excited. I, here I was stuck with psycho, uh, psychiatry, and I felt when we are psychiatrists, this is by far the most interesting thing you can do to study these, these uh, what I call now holotropic states of consciousness. So I spent about half of the time doing uh, psychedelic research, clinical research in Prague, and then later in the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And then I went to Esalen and Christina and I developed uh, the holotropic breathwork where you can induce similar kinds of states with faster breathing, with music, with body work. And then over the years we also uh, worked with a number of people who had what we call now spiritual emergencies, which is opening of the psyche, usually with powerful spiritual experiences that happens spontaneously without any pharmacological or other, other kind of uh, help. And we found out that you can work with these people in the same way in which you would work in psychiatric sessions of all tropic states. And that this is a very powerful alternative to the present <coughs> approach, which is simply use suppressing medication and stopping all the process. We came to the conclusion that this is a potentially transformative healing process, evolutionary process, that should be supported that should not be that should not be blocked i also spent a lot of time with anthropologists and shamans and uh, the various spiritual uh, spiritual teachers and parapsychologists and psychics and, uh, and uh, thanatologists and you know, people uh, uh, who were in uh, near death situations we also had a large study where we used uh, psychedelic sessions with cancer patients as a preparation, preparation for dying. And during this uh, research, <coughs> I ran into basically daily observations that were paradigm challenging, that could not be explained by psychology, by psychiatry, the way we have it now. 
And what I would like to try to do today is what I did in a uh, uh, paper, last paper in the uh, uh, Journal of Transversal Psychology, which I call Legacy Paper, basically summarizing the observations and the experiences from this half a century of study of these holotropic states and discuss what the implications would be for, for uh, psychiatry, psychology, psychotherapy. I'm aware that this is a highly controversial area, but uh, you know, in my age, I, I can afford it. I will just put out the whole vision. You will see that not much will be left of psychiatry and psychology as we as we know it. But it's not just my own work, but but uh, following the work of all kinds of transpersonal colleagues all over the world, I am just absolutely convinced that these are changes that should be made in psychology and psychiatry to make it more, more uh, effective. Uh, this kind of a started, this reminiscence started uh, when I was approaching my 70th birthday and I got a call from uh, uh, Jane Bunker, who was my editor at SUNY Press that published uh, quite a few of my books. And she said, Stan, we, we publish different books on different aspects of your work. Would you consider writing one book that would kind of bring it together and it would be like an like a introduction to all the other books? And then there was a long break and then she said, and would you try to focus specifically on those observations that current psychiatry and psychology cannot explain? Okay, and then there was an even longer uh, Great, and she said, and would you try to just sketch out what psychology and psychiatry would look like if you introduce all these observations and incorporate them? So, as you can see, this was a tall order, but uh, I was very excited because I was at the time considering uh, retiring, at least partially, and some more writing and reading. And we had the holotropic breathwork training happening all over the world. There was a whole new line of trainers, and we needed a text for the period that we teach. And this was an offer to make a manual for us. So I wrote the book, and I gave it a deliberately provocative title, Psychology of the Future. Now, if you write books like uh, Beyond the Brain or The Holotropic Mind, you know, people can take it or leave it. If you say this is psychology of the future, people will listen. They either get excited or they get pissed. They think, how dare you? Who do you think you are? Uh, uh, so this book is called Psychology of the Future. And uh, in, uh, behind most of the chapters, there is a book. So in a sense, the, the chapters are kind of uh, um, summaries of what you find in the book. So if you get, get interested in particular topic that is a book behind it. So I try now to summarize, you see, what, what the changes according to my uh, observations should be. Uh, now the first major change would be to expand vastly the cartography of the psyche that we have. What we are using in mainstream psychiatry is limited to postnatal biography. Freud said, uh, the newborn is a tabula rasa, it's a clean slate. There's nothing there, including birth itself, that would uh, be of interest for a psychologist as a psychiatrist. So all the interpretations, all the understanding, all the therapeutic approaches with this kind of orientation are focused on postnatal biology. If you work with holotropic states, you have to expand it vastly. First of all, uh, there is a very powerful representation of the birth experience, of the birth trauma. Vast, vast domain is tremendous emotional charge with a lot of uh, records of uh, um, very painful physical sensations that were associated with birth. And when I worked with people who regressed to the childhood, I found out that the, the experience is brave in the four uh, kind of uh, experiential clusters or constellations, and I call them um, basic perinatal matrices. Uh, 
Now this basic paradigm, the basic paradigm to make this is our experiences that we had in the different stages of birth, but there are more than that. They also represent each of them a specific opening into the next vast domain that we now call transpersonal. So transpersonal experiences would be experiences in which I would experience oneness with another person. I would experience consciousness of group of people. I can identify with all of humanity. I can have experiential identification with different, uh, different animals, with plants even, uh, even inorganic. It's possible to experience the consciousness of granite, the consciousness of a, of a diamond, and so on. So, uh, if you work with holotropic states, you need a really large cartography of the psyche in which everything that we experience as an object in everyday life can experience or has a representation as a subjective experience. It's very much like in the e great Eastern philosophies where we talk about uh, absolute, uh, you know, absolute consciousness. Everything is conscious. Everything is consciousness. Uh, then there are also experiences, uh, transpersonal experiences, that take us back into the past, to other centuries, to other cultures, sometimes with the sense of personal remembering, that we call them past life experiences. Again, very, very important category of experiences, but sometimes the authentic authenticity can be, in certain cases, actually uh, confirmed. And if it's not specifically the the event that's being described, then that is an amazing insight that the person who has past life experience gets into uh, the culture of that time, the costumes, the, uh, the weapons, the, you know, the, the architecture of the time. That goes way beyond, uh, way beyond uh, the intellectual knowledge which they have. So there's a way of learning about the universe and its history, not just by observing things and uh, and analyzing things, but also by becoming at different aspects of the universe in uh, these holotropic states. So that's a large map of the psyche. It also indicates something else that would come as a surprise to many people in academic circles, and that is that consciousness is not a product of the brain. Something much, much larger. It's a cosmic phenomenon. Jung talked about anima, anima mundi. So we have uh, actually absolutely no proof in, in psychiatry and psychology that consciousness is coming from the brain, which seems to be a very basic metaphysical assumption of metaphysical science. What we have is we have close correlations between anatomy, physiology, biochemistry of the brain, and states of consciousness. But this is in no way proof that consciousness is actually coming out of the body, out of the brain. It would be like saying that because there is a correlation between the components of the television set and the, the program, the quality of the sound and the, the picture, and that that depends specifically on components in that box, all it says that there is a correlation there, it has nothing to do with the problem of where the program is coming from. If we study all the components in the television, we will not understand why at 7 o'clock uh, you know, there's a Mickey Mouse cartoon or a, a Star Trek. So all the observations that we have about these correlations indicate uh, uh, the connection between brain and uh, consciousness, but leave open the, the possibility that the brain mediates consciousness systematically. It does not generate it. And as you know, we have now in transpersonal psychology a lot of direct proofs for that. The most obvious that you all know is the era, uh, the area of um, near-death experiences, where people, uh, including blind people at the time when they uh, experience uh, near death and the consciousness leaves the body, they can see the environment, they can observe it from the, from the ceiling, they can travel to other parts of the building or rise above it and see the, the environment. 
they can experience things that are happening thousands of miles away. And if we have an open-minded, uh, open-minded researcher, uh, it's possible to confirm that these things were actually happening. We turned up visions of these of these people. So that's another category where we would have to radically change our uh, understanding. So consciousness would not be seen as a product of the brain, but something that's significantly connected with the brain, it's mediated uh, certainly by the brain. And the, the human psyche uh, is not uh, limited to postnatal biography and the Freudian individual unconscious, but in a sense is commensurate uh, with all there is. And we get our sort of individual selection from it, something that's teased out of this cosmic, large cosmic fabric and the boundaries between our perceptual field and this large cosmic field are not absolute, they are negotiable, they can be transcended in these states. Now the next, uh, uh, the next um, category where we would have to change radically our, our thinking is about emotional and psychosomatic uh, problems, disorders, that are not organic, we are not talking Alzheimer or, or uh, temporal tumor or uh, you know, the progressive paralysis and so on. We are talking about those emotional psychosomatic disorders where we cannot find a biological cause, a sort of functional or psychogenic as we call it. Now in current uh, Mainstream psychiatry is the idea if something is not organic, it started sometime after we were uh, born in different periods of our life. And you know that, for example, Freud and his followers created this uh, kind of dynamic taxonomy of emotional disorders where you can link them to stages of the libido development and stages of the uh, relationship. Uh, the, development of object relationships. So alcoholism, uh, um, drug addiction, manic depressive uh, disorders would be seen as oral. Obsessive compulsive neurosis in, in classical psychoanalysis would be seen as uh, related to anal fixation. Uh, the problems for anxiety, hysteria, which are very <coughs> phobias or Conversion is very started when we were about four years old in connection with some sexual traumas. Now, if you work with uh, holotropic states, you will find many of these kinds of things described in psychoanalysis, but the problem is that it's related only to a very superficial layer in the psyche. If you have a method like uh, psychedelics or uh, breath work, uh, reversing, um, or if, you, if your psyche is activated spontaneously, like in spiritual emergency, the experiences will not stay in the biographical realm. You, you find out that, that if you look for deeper roots of the problems, they will be uh, in one of the perinatal matrices. There will be some uh, emotions and some important physical feelings that are fed into the symptoms from the perinatal level and then you'll find even deeper roots that will, that will take you to something like past life experiences or uh, the arch some archetypal uh, motifs or even phylogenetic uh, motifs. So uh, behind uh, emotional psychosomatic symptoms, there are layered constellations of memories, some of them coming from different periods of uh, postnatal life, some from one of the various matrices, and some of them all the way from the, from the transpersonal realm. And to, to work effectively with these problems, we have to allow ourselves to go to all the layers from which the, the symptoms are uh, kind of uh, nourished. Now this uh, seems like very bad news. You know, we thought all we have to do is do some, some work on infancy and childhood it's going to be fine. And here the playground is the whole universe. But the good news is that uh, if we work with holotropic, 
we discovered very powerful uh, and by mainstream psychiatry unrecognized healing mechanisms, mechanisms of profound transformation of spiritual opening and so on. So uh, a lot of problems can be at least alleviated, if not resolved, by working through the birth trauma, bringing the emotions, bringing the, the physical sensations and, and uh, expressing them and integrating that material. There are very powerful healing mechanisms connected to past life experiences. I've seen many situations of phobias, of uh, deep depression, of uh, psychosomatic pains of various kinds, migraine headaches, and pains in the body, and so on, that we work on, and the ultimate solution came in connection with a past life, reliving of a, what seemed to be a past life experience. So there is this, uh, you know, there is this uh, healing potential on many different levels of the uh, unconscious, and some of them we simply have not been using in in uh, traditional psychiatry and, and psychotherapy. I'll just give you quickly uh, examples of what I mean. I talk about these constellations, underlying symptoms, as coed systems, systems of condensed experience. So let's say somebody can have asthma, psychogenic asthma, and there would be behind it experience of near drowning when they were 14, experience of being repeatedly strangled by an older sibling at the age of four, very serious whooping cough or diphtheria, it's choking at the age of two, then connection to a difficult situation in birth where maybe the shoulder was trapped behind the um, pubic bone of the mother, and then at the depth would be a past life experience that involves strangling, hanging, and so on. Uh, another quick one, there was a man who had serious pain, chronic pain, no organic finding, no uh, medical help to speak of, and found behind it a coexistence where he was from Australia, when they were, when he was seven years old, they were digging a tunnel on the beach. He, he uh, sort of went in, and the kids were jumping, and it buried him, and he almost died. They just got him in the last moment. Then there was a, a stuck, an experience of being stuck in the birth canal, and then on a deeper level, he was in a battle, riding a horse, and was hit by a lancet, and fell down, and the horses sort of ran over him, and Killed him, crushed him. So when he when he managed to work all these through all these levels of experiences, there was no more pain, and we, had, we became friends, and we had seen him for years afterwards, and the pain never came back. Okay, I will just mention uh, one more thing, uh, really important thing, and that's the strategy of self exploration and therapy. Now, as you know, we have an enormous number of schools, and each school will tell you something different about what are the uh, most important motivating forces in the psyche, why do symptoms develop, what they mean, and each of those techniques, in each of those schools will give you a different technique, and each then would present it as a kind of method of choice, a scientific approach to uh, this particular problem. Now, but can you imagine the differences? You take a phobia to a behaviorist and then to a psychoanalyst, and then you continue and give it to a therapist who initially um, in, were inspired by Freud, but now develop their own schools and see things differently. So basically, the way it is now, you can, you can flip a coin and you can choose a school and with each school comes a different explanation, what's wrong with you, and different suggestions as to what you should, uh, what you should uh, do about it. Now what, what's important in uh, many um, psychotherapeutic approaches is interpretation, where you interpret what is coming up. I remember in my own analysis, you know, very frequently saying something and then hearing from the analyst, well, that's what you think it is, but according to psychoanalysis, this is, I got a different kind of 
explanation. Uh, now the problem is that had I had a therapist with different orientation, I would have gotten different uh, uh, interpretations. So interpretation cannot be really the major vehicle here. You see, if this were the case, then the therapeutic results of therapeutic schools would have to be distributed on a curve where some of the schools would have the most accurate understanding of the psyche and give the most appropriate uh, interpretations and the others would be um, distributed on the descending part of that curve depending on how much they, their understanding sort of deviates from, from the understanding. Uh, just a quick example. I had a, an analyst who was really orthodox uh, Freudian, and um, he used to say, that, uh, there's nothing that psychoanalysis cannot explain in the psyche. There are only things that psychoanalysis cannot explain. And he was a kind of, um, I wanted to say, elderly gentleman. He was probably 10 years younger than I am now. Um, uh, but it was known about him that once in a while he would doze off. You know, you free associate and you try to do something to bring him back into the process. And uh, there were about seven of us uh, psychiatrists of the same age working with him. And we knew this, we were making jokes about it. And we also were meeting in seminars where we could ask questions. And so one of the questions that came up was, what happens when a psychoanalyst falls asleep? If I keep free associating, does therapy continue? You know, is the process interrupted? Should you get refunded? <laughs> Important. He was also uh, a great admirer of Ivan Petrovich Pavlov, who got the Nobel Prize for the uh, conditioned reflexes in dogs. And Pavlov talks a lot about the inhibition of the cortex, and that when that happens, you can have a waiting point, like in hypnosis, for example. You know, the, the cortex is inhibited, but there is a waiting point. And Pablo's favorite uh, example is a mother who uh, would sleep uh, through heavy noises but wakes up when her own child is moaning. And so his response to our question was, well, it can happen, you know. Sometimes you're tired, you're recovering from a flu, uh, you didn't sleep enough. Yeah, it can happen. But if you work in this business for a long time, you develop this sixth sense. You fall asleep only when the stuff that's coming up is irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> and something important comes up and you wake up and you're right there. It's relevant by whose judgment, you understand? Different schools would interpret it differently. Um, uh, and we are not generally even sort of upset about it. There are so many different opinions and so many different therapies. And if I'm a beginning psychiatrist, I look at the market and I, I choose a therapy. For me, it was Freud. Wow, this is where I said, this is where I'm going to get my training. And then if it doesn't work out, then we go and we get another training and yet another training. So what is the alternative that the holotropic states uh, offer? It's quite, quite interesting. Uh, you find out that if you get into non-ordinary states, it kind of mobilizes inner healing intelligence, self-healing intelligence. That means that that state automatically starts bringing to the surface uh, uh, elements from the unconscious that have a very strong emotional charge, but they're also close to the threshold of consciousness, so they are available today uh, for processing. There's some other important and heavily charged problems that will have to wait three or four sessions before they get into the position towards the threshold of consciousness that they can emerge for processing. So uh, that whole emphasis here shifts now to the client and the self-healing uh, abilities of the client. It's not the brilliant therapist who comes with the right kind of interpretation and sort of throws it there and things will magically change. Uh, when we work with these states, whether it's psychedelics or breath work or some, you know, shamanic methods uh, or working with spiritual emergency, we become more like midwives to 
process is already there, and the best we can do is to kind of intelligently support what is happening and not do anything until and unless it gets stuck. Then we do just a little that is necessary to get the process going, and uh, then we step back and let the, let the client or the person in the workshop to do it uh, by, uh, by themselves. Now we, we found that this is really a very, very powerful way, although it's not the easiest one, it's not the easiest one for the person who is experiencing it and for the, for the facilitators. Much easier to do psychoanalysis the way I was trained. You know, uh, when 55 minutes come, I say, well, okay, we'll continue on Thursday. If you work with holotropic states, uh, the interesting thing is that the psyche <coughs> brings the material in quantum. It sort of, it, the material comes up, culminates, and then it's a uh, result. And then it's necessary to do, do things to get the best possible grounding for each, each uh, of, the, of the sessions. Uh, but we are not the ones who um, guide the session, which is sort of, we, we support it. Okay, I think these are, these are the most, uh, most important things. Uh, I don't want to open a can of worms uh, uh, this time. Uh, I have done now work with Rick Tarnas. How many of you know Rick Tarnas? Okay, for 30 years we have been following the astrological correlations uh, of these non ordinary states of consciousness. And he found out, we found out that this is the only tool that we were able to come up that can predict what kind of experiences people will have when they take a psychedelic uh, session or when they do a holotropic breathwork or what would be the transits, the planetary transits at the time when they are going through a um, spiritual crisis, a spiritual emergency. We have never seen anybody going through a spiritual crisis who would not have some hard aspects of the four outer planets. Now this is the way this whole thing happened uh, over 30 years ago when Rick came to uh, SLM uh, was asking me to be on his dissertation which was on LSD, LSD psychotherapy and uh, there was a man who came who was kind of a, like a walking, you know, uh, ephemeris. He was carrying ephemeris uh, uh, in, uh, under his uh, arm and he was just correlating everything that was happening in his life and around him with uh, planetary transits. And he said, you guys, if you work with non-ordinary states or holotropic states, why don't you use astrology? Astrology should be like a perfect, perfect tool for this. And uh, astrology was still too much for both of us, although we had done by then, you know, our share of uh, inner experiences. And uh, I was open to acupuncture and uh, e ching and things like that. But we said, you know, what is there to lose? So we decided to look into it. We learned from him how to cast a chart. At that time, it's quite a job. Now you can just push a button on the, <laughs> on the computer. And SLN is like this incredible human laboratory. A lot of people having gestalt sessions, holotropic breathwork sessions, somebody that, you know, it's, psychedelic session on the side, somebody, a uh, spiritual emergency or a breakdown. So we started looking at these correlations and the first thing that struck us was that the, what I described as the phenomenology of the four perinatal matrices, the experiences related to reliving of the experiences in the different stages of birth, uh, could just as well be paragraphs from a handbook of uh, astrology. How many of you know something about astrology or are interested in astrology? Some. Okay, so if the first one... <coughs> we still have five, five minutes about yeah. Uh, the first matrix is this. The fetus is still in the womb. So this is related to, to water. It's related to uh, mystical union, oceanic, uh, aquatic uh, 
kind of experiences, cosmic experiences, dissolution of boundaries. What, what, what archetype would that be? Neptune. Neptune. Okay, the second matrix is when the uterus is contracting, but the, the cervix is not open. So it's called compression, oppression, depression, starvation, this guilt that comes up. Saturn. Heavy pressures, what would that be? Saturn. Saturn would be, you know, shadow aspect of Saturn. Then look at the third one. It would, uh, what's involved there is actually the ch choking creates powerful sexual arousal. So it's, it's uh, related to birth, death, encounter with death, sex, rebirth, powerful energy, and also uh, elimination, there's biological products there. Pluto? Which archetype would cover that? Powerful energies. Pluto? Pluto. Pluto? Pluto. Birth, sex, death, rebirth. Pluto. Pluto, okay? Exactly, Pluto. And then we have the fourth one, sudden unexpected uh, uh, escape or resolution of a difficult situation, breakthrough, breakthrough, rising to new levels of insight, uh, illuminating insight, uh, divine epiphany, uh, light. Uranus. Liberation. Uranus. Uranus, okay. So this is strange. Why? Something that I got out of the sessions of people who took LSD uh, that are related to stages of birth should be correlated with planetary archetypes. But then the really mind-blowing insight came that people actually would confront experientially these matrices when they have those planets as transiting planets. Transits are uh, represented by the relationship where the planets are now and where they were at the time of your of your birth. So you have a certain chart for your whole life that shows the archetypal possibilities and then you have transits as the planets are moving there creating aspects of figures with uh, um, the places where your, your planets were at the time when you were born. So um, I would just bring to your attention uh, <coughs> which is called archive, but uh, archetypal uh, astrology, which was started by uh, Rick and, and some of his friends. And also, I have on the, uh, I don't have time to go, this is a too complex an issue. You can get uh, to my website, which is my full name, sinusarthrop.com, and there are a couple of uh, papers on how we use astrology, if, if that's something that you are that you are uh, interested in. Okay, so I will just sort of uh, wrap it up and see that it's a major, major changes that will have to be done, expanding the cartography so that it, it would include not just biography, but the perinatal level, and then this vast transpersonal realm. Uh, you would find out that consciousness is not a product of the brain, that it's mediated through the brain, but not produced by the brain, which really undermines the you know, basic metaphysical assumption of materialistic science, uh, that the roots of emotional, psychosomatic, and interpersonal problems don't just go to infancy and childhood, but they have additional roots on the perinatal level and then the transpersonal level. And then there is an alternative to what we have, what we are trying to do in many of the psychotherapist which is trying to use our intellect to understand how the psyche functions in general and the psyche of our client and then come up with interpretations and, and, and interventions and so on. And the alternative is to induce a holotropic state of consciousness and then just use the kind of a inner radar quality that that state will find those places that need to be worked on and can be, can be uh, worked on and then we become uh, supporters. Actually, the, the uh, original term therapeutes means not somebody who gets and fixes people, but somebody who intelligently cooperates in the, in the healing process. Mm -hmm. And then just as a suggestion, if you want to look at the amazing predictive power of a 
astrology, but the, as the predictions are archetypal, they are not, they are not concrete. Okay, I believe uh, myself that if we don't introduce these changes, that we will have only a superficial understanding of emotional psychosomatic uh, disorders, that psychiatry will not have really uh, adequate understanding of ritual and spiritual life and religious life of humanity, that we will not adequately understand shamanism, uh, rites of passage, ancient mysteries, or things that happen to people in some intense spiritual practice, the experiences of yogis, of uh, Buddhists of various uh, orientation, of Taoists, of Christian mystics. We really need this kind of a, an understanding of, of the psyche. Now, this, uh, if this would be uh, accepted by mainstream, mainstream uh, circles, this would be the end of transpersonal psychology. We would not need transpersonal psychology. It would just be psychology, only describing the psyche in its true dimensions and, and its true capacities. We also would not need parapsychology. Parapsychology is there because the current uh, paradigm cannot explain what is happening there. If, if we work with non-ordinary states, that is extrasensory approach to information uh, about a number of things. I mentioned about other people, about animals, about plants, about history and so on. So uh, we don't need just uh, to study you know, telepathy, uh, uh, psychometry, uh, telekinesis, some of the five or six areas that, 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 uh, that um, these uh, Parapsychology focuses on because of the parapsychological elements would be distributed in the whole psyche. So we just study the psyche that would have the biographical dimension, the perinatal dimension, and the transpersonal dimension. But we don't need specific. So we don't need specific uh, disciplines studying transpersonal phenomena. Like if you are a therapist, you have to have a large enough map. Uh, so that you can follow the client wherever the client goes, but the material comes from the client, whether it's going to be something about their current life, or whether they're going to be uh, ready to birth, or whether it's going to be something that comes from the, from the transpersonal level, that's determined by the process, the process uh, itself. So anyway, I'm going to end here. Um, again, I'm, I'm aware that this is a, this is a very, very you know, controversial suggestion because uh, also of, of the scope of it. It's not something that you can handle by a little ad hoc hypothesis, by a little patchwork. It really would mean to uh, accept that we have to radically change our thinking about the psyche, about consciousness, uh, to really get better results than, than we are getting currently. Okay, thank you very much for your for your attention. <laughs> if you want, would like you to hear it in a, or read it in a more articulate way, it's on my the larger paper is on my website again, Stanislavgrove.com. And I think we have time. I will. Let uh, Steve sort of uh, be the timekeeper here. Uh, but, uh, I understand we have time for a few questions, yeah? Yeah, we'll give you a few minutes. Steve? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. <coughs> Can we use the. Uh, uh, There's the a mic? mic up there. If you want to ask a question or stand, please go up to the mic. Okay. Hi. Um, I'd actually been curious to ask you for some time. I I wonder if you understand your basic perinatal matrices as being um, also a metaphor for stages of transformation in general. That is a metaphor for uh, stages of transformation in general. I'm sorry, could you do it once? Oh, stages of transformation in general. 
like um, age of their stages, 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 stages of transformation. Stages of transformation. Uh, well, there, there, you can see two ways that many people who relive uh, episodes of birth, they also get uh, sort of some material from the transpersonal very frequently, uh, past life uh, type of experiences. And they told me on many occasions that they see the transverse the perinatal level as a kind of transformation station, which the something that has just the form of a field, like the Akashic field, the, the karmic field, is channeled into our present life and gets the kind of a, a, biopsycho, a biopsychological nature rather than being just a field. So, so it sort of is imprinted somehow in our body because we have certain kind of Birth, we certain things will be happening. We will be, and that will be able to do certain things. So that's the transformation in this direction. But there are also certainly transformation agents uh, as we work on that. When when you are reliving birth, that it's uh, not just reliving of your birth, but ultimately it becomes the process of psycho spiritual death and rebirth. The opening is not just into the light of the operation room or the light of the day, but the, the light will have luminous quality. It, it, it's a spiritual light. So that's sometimes the uh, images of archetypal beings in light can sort of appear in their context. So, so again, another way of looking at it is like, it seems like we are cut off from the cosmic matrix during the passage through the birth canal. And then when we are processing it, when we bring in the, the unlived parts of the of uh, the birth experience, we bring it into consciousness and process it, it needs uh, the, the spiritual open. So it's like, a, like an hourglass, you see, you go in, in a tunnel and then you go, you go back to the tunnel. Thank you. It's just one more thing to put in that you asked. Uh, I initially put much more emphasis on the perinatal matrices because I was coming from a medical background and, and very materialistic. I studied medicine in Prague when we had a Marxist uh, regime. <coughs> but as I was going further, I got to the point where, where we now think more in terms of the, the archetypes. So that what's happening on birth level is just just a certain form of expression of archetypal energies. I don't see them as being the source of the, the, you know, the perinatal experiences. Uh, I asked this question one time that there was a book signing, and uh, I was kind of going for the throne of transpersonal psychology. And then, uh, I was trying to ask this question yesterday, uh, trying to get to a core transpersonal psychology interest to people in general, I think. We learned about it in, when you defined it or named it in the, in the 60s. I, I might have to ask you to, if you can come closer. Oh. It's, not, it's not just the age, it's also you know, many years of loud music. With the <laughs> <laughs> so last night there was a book signing, and I asked this question. It was kind of to me, it's like going for the throat of transpersonal psychology in terms of you know, what people seem to be most concerned about. This that I talked to is this coin was raised, I think, by you in the late 60s due to all this psychedelic experiences people were having. And we couldn't explain it with regular psychology. And we were very impressed by the fact that people were saying they were having experiences of enlightenment that you know, even the most advanced of Buddhist monks would take whole lifetimes to achieve. And so we were kind of wondering um, when it became illegal to pursue that, we were looking for other means to achieve these states. And I think Tim Leary's book on the psychedelic experience pointed to the fact that the Tibetan Book of the Dead indicated that the Tibetans had already worked much of this out in 10,000 years on the Tibetan plateau. So the problem there is, again, you can't see how it did some significant um, work on themselves and that transfers from experiences. Now exactly how far it goes, you know, and, uh, but I think it would be very relevant. Just to you start time, yeah. Yeah, we're a little over. 
So I just want to give a warm round of applause for Stan. For <laughs> So we will have a coffee tea break right now in the room right behind the lobby. Um, we'll go there and we'll start back about 